good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate you being here. We're very honored this morning to have uh, Dr. Aaron Moberly here from uh, Ohio State University, where he's going to talk to us about uh, speech perception with cochlear implants. We're uh, very uh, pleased that he accepted our invitations to come here. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to uh, Aaron, if you, if you don't know him, if you haven't met him. Uh, he comes just from Ohio State University, where he's uh, served for a number of years there as an associate professor in the otolaryngology department. He also holds an adjunct title in the speech and hearing uh, uh, division there. His educational background is that he uh, did his undergraduate work at Purdue, uh, then transitioned to Indiana University for medical school and residency, then Ohio State uh, University for uh, his fellowship in neurotology, and then stayed on there as a faculty member. Uh, Aaron and I met each other a number of years ago uh, when he was a resident at Indiana, and when I was in practice there, uh, he came to work with me a bit in my office uh, to get some additional uh, exposure to neurotology, and uh, it's really a, a very big deal that he's here today uh, because his presence here today dispels the common belief held by our residents that time in my clinic is wasted time. So uh, very, very useful that he's here today. Uh, so uh, in his professional career, Aaron has been tremendously productive. Uh, he has over hundred publications, a uh, number of book chapters, countless presentations uh, on a, both a national and international level uh, and a very active uh, research endeavor. Uh, his research has uh, been funded <clears throat> by a number of organizations. He's been the recipient of a core grant a K-23 grant, an R-21 grant, and an R-01 grant. Uh, much of his research focuses on speech perception for cochlear implant recipients, and an additional element uh, of his research is focused on uh, developing uh, techniques and devices to help diagnose ear pathology. Uh, he's won a number of awards basically at every level of his academic career. Uh, he, uh, in terms of otolaryngology, he's won the Mosher Award, which as we all know is one of the most uh, prestigious awards to win. Uh, for residents, take note, he was the highest in-service score in the nation two years in his residency, so uh, something to aspire to there. Uh, he also won a medal in medical school for being the top medical student, uh, so a number of awards throughout his career. Despite all of these things, he's also a dedicated family man uh, in Columbus, where he's active in his community and enjoys spending time with his wife and two children. So very much an honor to have him here today. I think his talks will be very informative. I thank you all for being here. So without any further ado, Aaron, come on up. Thank you. Uh, that was a very nice introduction. And what I share this one, no. Share, there we go. Does that look good? Hopefully we can tell if it looks good at home. Oh, there I am, I don't, okay. Uh, no, thank you for the introduction, very nice. Uh, we were just talking before about introductions and if it's, if it's stuff that you can't verify, those are the best things to put into introductions. So I really, really like that. No, but it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to visit. I've had a really great visit here. Thank you for inviting me and um, hopefully I can provide something of interest this morning. Um, the nice thing about virtual conferences is I don't have to see everyone asleep. I can only see like half the people asleep. So let's get um, adjusted. All right, so um, yeah, I'm gonna be talking about uh, cognition, speech recognition, and adult cochlear implant users today. And there we go. Here's these disclosures. Um, had a lot of support over the last few years. And I really appreciate all that support to help me to get to where I am so far. Bigger, uh, perhaps more importantly, lots and lots of collaborators and mentors and, and people who've really helped along the way. And so I wanna acknowledge all them. I like to do that up front because I don't think I'd be where I am without having all the input from these folks. Um, so my interest in this topic really started during fellowship when I was focusing on, on seeing adults in the clinic who were um, interested in getting cochlear implants or they already had them. And, um, you know, people would come in, these older adults would come in and say, doc, is this CI thing gonna help me? We'd say, well, you know, in general, we think so. Um, typically people score about 80% open set sentence recognition after a cochlear implant, which is much better than what you're doing right now. Um, then they'd say, well, is it really gonna help me though? And we'd say, probably you'll get about 80% correct on speech recognition. So the, the problem is, there's this huge range of performance after cochlear implantation. And we don't have a good way of explaining or predicting how someone is going to do with a cochlear implant before they get it. That's a big clinical problem. That's really what drew me into this. Another part of this 
is on the flip side of that to some degree is why does a particular patient not do well with cochlear implants? So generally speaking, there's a lot of work that's been done here looking at imaging based um, electrode placement, those types of things. But even with that, the majority of patients who are not doing very well, their electrode is still placed reasonably appropriately. They've been mapped as appropriately as possible. And some people just do not do well. We consider those poor performers, which is kind of a nebulous term, but we've all seen them. Why is that? Um, and so that was a curiosity to me. And then a third question that's kind of uh, developed over time uh, in my group is, uh, and others is, does cochlear implantation actually lead to improvements in cognition? So I'll touch on that at kind of the end of the, the uh, talk here. So this has led to these basic research questions. How do we understand the variability and individual differences in outcomes among our adults with cochlear implants? And part of the issue is, if you review the literature, especially the bigger case series, um, case reviews of thousands of patients, they're always focused on these audiological and demographic factors, duration of hearing loss, severity of hearing loss before getting an implant, um, do they use a, a hearing aid? What's the etiology of the hearing loss? But all of these together only predict a very small fraction of that outcome uh, variability. So it's not all that helpful. So we need better indicators or predictors of outcomes. Um, again, on the same idea, how do we predict and explain uh, a poor performance? And again, like I mentioned, it's not usually the, the device, but do we have any tasks or anything that we can use to really help identify beforehand someone who's likely to be a poor performer or after the fact, why are they a poor performer? Along with those lines, how do we tailor individualized approaches to rehabilitation for these patients, whether it's device related or whether it's rehab related? And that gets into a whole topic of uh, adult uh, cochlear implant auditory rehabilitation, which at OSU, I'm proud that we've started to develop a program to try to do that um, with SLPs involved in more of a hands-on approach, clinician guided uh, training and auditory rehab. And again, the last thing is just how does cochlear implantation impact cognition? I'll talk more about that near the end of the talk. So I'm not gonna really talk about the rehab stuff today. Don't really have time for it. Um, that's a very collaborative effort with the SLPs and uh, audiologists at our institution, but um, happy to discuss it later if people are interested. So I wanna start off. So in fellowship, uh, Susan Nittrauer was my main research mentor that I really started to work with closely at OSU during my first year of fellowship. And she, her work really drew me into uh, this topic beyond just this clinical question of outcome variability. How do we start studying that? So her background, uh, she's actually, she was a teacher of the deaf and then she, her work is longitudinal studies looking at speech and language development in children with hearing loss. And so one of her areas of focus was uh, things looking at perceptual organization, how the brain uses the information that comes in and organizes that into meaningful percepts and also something called cue weighting. So cue weighting, these were the first couple studies I did with her where you're essentially, when you take speech, you have speech that is, uh, the characteristics of speech differ across frequency and temporal properties. So sort of timing cues and, and frequency related cues. And normal hearing individuals, generally speaking, across a lot of different phoneme contrasts, different speech sounds, they tend to focus very heavily on the frequency specific information. Well, cochlear implants don't provide very detailed frequency specific information. So uh, one idea that's been borne out in a lot of studies is that CI users end up weighting the temporal uh, or timing information much more heavily because that information comes through the device better. Question is, does that matter? Does the way that people weight this information impact their performance? So what we're doing here, these were a couple different tasks looking at um, perceptual attention to cue weighting, spectral cues versus temporal cues. I don't even need to necessarily show this other than the idea of these tasks with it, there's a, a reasonably strong correlation between weighting of spectral or frequency information and their performance on word, word recognition. So the idea there, just to sum that up, is um, the way people use the information that comes through their device, the way they weight different aspects of that input relates to how well they understand speech. And if they do it more like normal hearing listeners, they tend to do better. The other part of this is it's not just, we also did tests of discrimination. It's not just how well is that information presented through the implant, it's how much does the person's brain rely on that information. So this to me was fascinating. It's not just about the quality of the signal coming in, but it's how that individual's brain uses that information to make sense of speech. I thought that was great. And that was sort of my intro into thinking more about how the brain influences perception. Well, the brain is perception. That's where all perception happens. Um, but got me very interested in that. So I, I always give her credit for sort of 
getting me excited about this field. We also then looked more at something called phonological sensitivity, which is really how well can people kind of pick out sounds within the speech signal, um, sort of their access to the sounds of speech. And I ran across some uh, earlier studies um, that had looked at the effects of hearing loss on people's sort of representations of speech sounds in their brain. So if you think about hearing speech, you have these really crisp representations, if you have normal hearing, of how speech sounds, all the little individual speech sounds. Um, with hearing loss, those become fuzzy. You're getting this sort of garbled input, and with a cochlear implant, it's similar. You have this garbled input that's coming in, and the thought is that these representations of speech in your brain kind of um, degrade over time. And so we, these, this group had looked at, at measures getting along those lines and had found that those, that people's ability to access this phonological structure of, 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 of speech degrades with hearing loss. And so we wanted to know, well, does that also impact how people would do with a cochlear implant? And indeed, in a couple of studies here, uh, we found some correlation of some basic measures of phonological sensitivity with how well people can understand speech. Um, so the idea here is that people's representations of speech in their long-term memory, their ability to access or tap into those representations impacts how well they can hear with a cochlear implant. Okay, so in general, that idea is this perceptual attention, the way that the brain pays attention to cues within the signal and sensitivity to the phonological structure of the signal relates to speech recognition. Along the same lines, I was doing a lot more reading at that time, thinking about um, what other types of cognitive functions contribute to people's ability to understand speech under degraded conditions? And I ran across some great review articles. Larry Humes has done a lot of this work at Indiana um, for many years, looking in people with milder degrees of hearing loss and hearing aids. Um, but essentially, these were some nice review papers of um, looking at different cognitive factors as they contribute to people's ability to understand speech through a hearing aid or understand speech and noise. Uh, one of the biggest ones that's coming out of this literature is working memory capacity, which I'll talk about here a little bit more in a minute. But there wasn't much of this work really looking at the cochlear implant population. And so there's similarities between listening through a hearing aid. There's also a lot of differences in terms of the quality of the signal that's coming through a cochlear implant. Um, and I wanted to know more about how those factors relate to outcomes. So at that time, I started coming up with this sort of basic, this isn't a real model that you can test, but it's sort of a conceptual framework looking at these different factors as they contribute to speech recognition in adults with cochlear implants. And um, starting with this idea of perceptual organization, different types of language skills and cognitive factors as they contribute. Um, and then the flip side of that is just the quality of the signal, which we call auditory sensitivity, or that's the term I've used, is what is the, the clarity of the signal coming through the cochlear implant, which varies among individuals. And more basically, you could characterize these as bottom up, kind of sensory input factors and top-down language and cognition factors. Um, and different fields look at that differently in sort of psychology, top-down processing is more controlled, effortful processing that you have to bring in to do a task. In linguistics, it's more how does language knowledge contribute, but you can kind of lump those all into how does, what does the brain bring to the table um, in listening to speech versus what does the signal coming in through the ear actually um, contribute? Okay, and so, uh, let me go through this little model a little bit more. So this was just, and this is a, again, it's a framework I've thought about frequently in terms of setting up studies and thinking about how to approach this. So the idea here is that in the middle, we have our outcome of speech recognition, whatever outcome you want to talk about. And you have these different factors that are contributing. So auditory, perceptual, cognitive, language factors. And what I was trying to represent here is the size of the circle demonstrates the, the magnitude of individual differences in listeners in that in that topic in that area um, and then in the middle trying to get at how much does that actual uh, region of uh, uh, functioning contribute to speech recognition so these are kind of different hypothetical models so in this case um, we have big variability across individuals and in how well that sensory input comes in what's the clarity of that signal some people get a really clear signal and some people get a really not so clear signal in general and we see here that that accounts for a very large portion of the variability in outcomes. To me, that would suggest clinically um, that that's the focus. You know, we need to be really focused on that signal quality. And that's, I would say, what the majority of CI research has really focused on is improving the signal coming through the device, improving mapping, 
in improving electrolyte placement. Um, however, what if it's more like this, where you have, yes, the, the auditory input matters a great deal, but these cognitive functions also vary dramatically among people and they contribute a large amount of variance to speech recognition outcomes. That would suggest to me, um, and this is sort of more of a model that I think is more realistic in terms of what the data are showing, those cognitive functions contribute quite a bit and they vary across people. And that, that would suggest, well, maybe focusing more on the brain in our rehabilitation approaches makes sense at a very high level. Okay, so, so that's sort of the framework I've been thinking. And, and part of this then moving forward from that is, well, how do we test this? How do we develop studies to analyze this? And a big thing is, well, we need to identify some speech recognition measures to start with that they are good for studying this. So we need, a, what we've done is come up with a battery of measures that we've used for a few years, um, varying across uh, words, sentences that are contextualized or meaningful, anomalous sentences. And then these presto sentences um, were uh, developed at, at Indiana also that are um, high variability. So every sentence is spoken by a different talker with a different dialect. And that makes a very challenging condition because your attention is constantly switching to different things. Um, and it's, it's just a challenging listening condition. So the point of using these is we see a nice broad range of performance across CI users. Um, and that allows us to do some correlational analyses or regression modeling because our outcome is highly variable. So these are sort of the outcome battery of measures that we've been using. Let me pull that, make sure, just keep track of my time. We have, is it 7.45, is that right? Ish, okay. So from there, then next thing that I wanna focus on today more is sort of this cognitive battery, cognitive assessment tools that we can use to try to study and relate to speech recognition outcomes. And again, I wanna um, give a shout out to Dave Pizzoni, who's been big in this area, particularly in the PEDS literature. Uh, Derek Hughes and Irina Castellanos are partners of mine at um, um, Ohio State, and they've contributed a lot of input and education to me as I've gone through this. So some of the ones that we focused on are, uh, these are basically just different uh, information processing mechanisms, different types of skills that the brain uses to, to complete tasks. Um, inhibition concentration, processing speed, nonverbal reasoning, working memory and verbal learning and memory are just a, a few of the ones. And I wanna just show you, I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail in these different tasks, but I wanna show you a number of studies that have shown these relationships between measures of cognition and speech recognition. One of the key things I wanna point out here is we use visual measures. Um, to assess these skills in our patients with cochlear implants. And that's because we know that the quality of the auditory input varies among them. So we wanna get audition out of the picture. It's plus and minus there. So we're assessing cognitive skills through visual tasks that help, help us hopefully get more of a global idea of their cognition. But we also know that how well people process information auditorily on tasks of cognition is going to impact their hearing abilities probably more directly. But the point being here, we're looking at cognition using visual measures. And these are pretty classic measures that have just been, most of them are computerized at this point. One of the things that is another focus is trying to develop pretty basic tasks and use basic tasks that could eventually be translated into the clinic if we, if we think that they're highly valuable. So what is the Stroop? People have probably run across this in undergrad psychology. This is a classic measure of inhibition concentration. So you're shown a color word on a screen and you have to respond, what is the color of the word? So the correct response here would be red. Um, so you have to inhibit your natural prepotent response of reading it, which if you're literate, um, that's, you're going to wanna say blue. But the correct response here is red. How long does it take you to do that? That's sort of your, your measure as a time response time. Um, and what we found in, in this, the details don't matter too much, but we're looking at speech recognition across a number of different measures and your performance on this Stroop task. And then what we find is that, you know, all of these are kind of small to moderate correlations uh, of, of this type of task with speech recognition outcomes. Again, this is postlingually deaf adults with cochlear implants. Um, so we have a smattering of ages from 50 to 85, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Another really basic one, this is not highly predictive of outcomes, but it's interesting. This is the test of word reading efficiency. You're given a list of words and a list of non-words, and you just read down it as quickly and accurately as possible. So you can see this list of non-words is, it's nonsense words, but you can sound these out. Um, and performance on this really short test takes about two minutes. 
um, is somewhat predictive of outcomes. And actually we have more recent data that's a little bit stronger relationship, but this is a basic word reading task that relates to how well people can understand speech with a cochlear implant. So this is getting into phonological representations. It's getting into lexical access speed. Um, these things that we know contribute to how well people understand speech, but can we assess that and use that as part of a battery to predict outcomes, predict and explain. Another one, this is another really classic test. It's from like the 1950s called the uh, Raven's Nonverbal uh, non Reason, Ma Raven's Progressive Matrices. You're given a problem solving task. You're essentially just trying to identify which of these selections fills in the blank. Um, and performance on this, again, we have a couple of studies that have shown performance on this task relates to how well people can understand sentences um, with a cochlear implant across several of these measures. One of the things, you know, it's, it's important to see uh, consistent trends in these relationships. So these aren't one-off relationships. There's something genuine. Again, the magnitude is not enormous, but as part of a battery, you know, this could be a valuable tool. Uh, working memory um, has received a lot of attention. We've used a number of working memory tasks and um, some of these vary from very short-term recall of a series of digits to more complex things like something called the reading span. Um, <laughs> This one is this one's a simple four-digit span where you're presented um, items on the screen and then you have to recreate that serial order. Or um, another case, like it's like if you were given a phone number and you had to repeat it back. Um, we have not found these measures to be all that predictive in our cochlear implant users. Uh, it may be the task that we're choosing. It may be the the actual speech outcomes that we're using. Number of different reasons. So we can get into that more later. But um, just want to show we're, we're assessing that in different ways as well. Okay, so that's kind of focused on, well, how do these cognitive functions contribute to outcomes? But really we can't ignore all the auditory input. We know that the quality of the signal coming in through that cochlear implant is very important. So I wanna focus a little bit on that. Uh, and we've used a number of psychophysical measures that we borrow from other institutions uh, to tap into spectral and temporal processing. And the one that we focused most on is the spectral temporally modulated ripple test um, that Aronoff and Landsberger developed. Uh, and this has been shown to have very nice correlations with speech, per, speech perception outcomes. It's kind of a combined frequency temporal processing task. So uh, one of the downsides of this, it doesn't exactly tease apart what's frequency related sensitivity versus temporal, but overall it's a very nice non-speech measure of hearing, um, super threshold hearing. So this basically you're presented with three sounds and you have to identify which of those is different. So it's something like shh, shh, shh that kind of thing. So these are very non-speech. You can use these in non-native listeners, um, but it gets at sort of people's resolution of these details of the sound without it being speech-based. And then there's a couple others. This one's uh, another interesting one from Rush. And then there's temporal resolution that's really looking at people's ability to differentiate um, signals based on amplitude modulation. And this is just some data that we, um, we have collected we see this nice strong relationship between all these outcome measures and the SMRT or the SMARTs, what we call it, um, very much less so with the temporal measures. I think that's kind of interesting and maybe it's because this amplitude modulation task is pretty simple and not speechy at all, um, but these simpler measures of temporal processing don't seem to relate that much. And I think that's kind of interesting from the standpoint of those original Q weighting studies that I did with uh, Dr. Nitrauer we focus very heavily on the qualities of the temporal input through the implant, but in some cases, that's probably not sufficient um, to really provide the information that we need. And that's part of the problem with the cochlear implant. But anyway, so we know that these measures also impact performance. So one of the things we're really interested in then in my group is how do these bottom up and top down processes interact? How is it that as the signal is degraded the, the language and cognitive functions can contribute to sort of compensating for that. That's one way of looking at it. So this is some, uh, this was Presto data. I believe these were Presto, um, where we basically just had two groups of listeners and we're looking at comparing those who did really well on Presto versus those who did not. And this is just, this is smart performance. So this is their spectral temporal resolution. And what is interesting from this plot is just looking at the fact that those people who did well had this really broad range of of auditory sensitivity, a bottom-up input. So the quality of that signal coming in for those individuals ranged very highly. But if you look at the low performers, 
almost across the board, they did very poorly on this. So there's something related here that if you have a very bad signal coming in, you can't use your language and, and cognitive functions to compensate for that, which is kind of intuitive. It makes sense that if the signal is so bad, there's nothing you can do to make up for it. But if the signal is reasonably good or above some sort of threshold, that's where those sort of top-down functions really seem like they're able to kick in. And that's one way of looking at it. Um, so I wanted to look at this a little bit more. So um, the next question was, well, how do these functions interact during speech recognition? And so um, this was a recently accepted study that, that sort of tried to look at this. And this was in a group of adult cochlear implant users, again, postlingually deafened. The idea here was that we think these top-down processes are gonna contribute to speech recognition uh, differentially depending on the quality of that bottom-up input. So if the signal is, is really good, the cognitive functions are gonna contribute differently than if the signal is really bad. So we had 51 CI users, um, pretty typical age, 65-ish, long duration of hearing loss. These are all very traditional cochlear implant um, candidates at the time of implantation. We collect all these data. These are all similar measures to what we've talked about previously. So we've got the SMART again is that spectrotemporal task and then these different top-down cognitive functions. And then we look to see how those relate to speech recognition. But what we did was we di divided these into three groups based on the bottom-up input. Initially, we thought about looking at this sort of linearly. Um, I'll come back to that later. But the point here is we, we broke this into three groups based on their SMRT performance, the low group, intermediate, and a high group. And then we looked at different relations within each of those groups among performance and the cognitive functions. Okay, so here's our group, here's our data. Again, we divided these, these groups by SMRT performance. So obviously they're going to differ based on SMRT performance, um, but they don't differ on too much else other than duration of hearing loss. Just interesting that people that had the longest duration of hearing loss had the worst bottom-up sensitivity. We haven't gone any further with that yet, but I think that's an interesting finding. Otherwise, the groups were very similar across the actual cognitive functions. So if you assess their cognition, they weren't dramatically different. Um, we do see here, I'll show it here. So, uh, well, okay. So um, the actual bottom-up performance uh, among the groups um, was, was very different as was their speech recognition. So for the three groups based on their bottom-up performance, we saw what we would expect that those with the best input do the best. Those with the worst or kind of junkiest input coming through their, their, their implant are doing the, the most poorly. Um, but then now we're running these kind of Spearman correlations within each of these groups. So this is the low bottom up group. This is the group that has the crappiest signal you could say. And we're really not seeing very much or consistent relations among these, bottom, these top down measures and their uh, speech recognition outcomes. Um, but as the signal gets better, you get to the intermediate group, you start seeing more of these relationships. And again, they're kind of moderate size, small to moderate, um, but you're starting to see them across multiple tasks. You always have to worry about, well, we're running a lot of correlations. You know, are we accounting for that? And um, part one solution here, when you have relatively small groups, like this is 16 or 17 individuals, is looking for consistency that these aren't just um, spurious findings from running a lot of correlations. But bottom line here is we're starting to see more relations there. And then when we get to the high group, so this is the people with the best signal, we start seeing more and more of these cognitive functions contributing to their outcomes. Um, another part of this is uh, Taryn Tamati is a, a linguist that works with, very closely with me who has helped with a lot of these different types of analyses. And one of the things she, she thought we should do is look to see if there's sort of a break point um, looking at the quality of the auditory input. So the SMRT scores right here, versus the CID scores, uh, CID's word recognition. And what we see is that low SMRT, we see this linear improvement. So as the signal gets better, again, their SMRT performance, what I mean by the signal, as that gets better, their word recognition increases. And then you hit some place where it doesn't happen anymore. So our interpretation or a possible interpretation is that this, again, this is that kind of lower performing group. As the signal gets better, they're gonna do better. And then you hit some threshold where the signal quality doesn't matter as much. That's where those top-down functions seem to be contributing more. At least that's the idea. So um, based on this study, it does look like these neurocognitive or top-down functions contribute different, differentially based on the degree of the bottom-up degradation. 
And we see sort of this different pattern among the groups. I don't put too much stock in which of these measures came out because these are still pretty small groups. But the general trend was we saw greater relation between top-down functioning and speech recognition, the better the signal quality. Oh, I'll come back to that. Another thing that Taryn's worked on, which is really cool, is clustering analyses. This is there's like a there's a bit of an art to doing these, but you're basically taking a large set of data and you're trying to cluster individuals based on their profiles. Um, and if you have to have a lot of patients, this was this here, I think, was only about 40. So we haven't done any publishing of this yet because it's it's still open to a lot of interpretation. But the idea here is um, go through this real quick. You have so what we're comparing here is meaningful sentence recognition in blue across these different clusters. And the clusters are based on their profile of bottom up and top down performance. And meaningful, meaningful, meaningful sentence recognition performance and uh, anomalous. Anomalous are non-meaningful, non non-contextualized sentences. So they're basically just word strings more or less. And what you see is you can have groups that end up with very similar meaningful sentence recognition, but they're anomalous sentence recognition may differ quite a bit. All that to say that people's performance, if you look at individuals, let's say in the clinic, people's performance may look very similar, but they may be using different functions or factors to get to that performance, uh, which is a really interesting idea that sometimes, for example, in this, in this group, they're really heavily capitalizing on context because without context, people don't do very well. With sentence context, they do much better. Whereas this group, there's not a big difference. So the idea here is that there are probably these clusters of patients or participants who are using different strategies to do the task of speech recognition. That's the bottom line. Um, and it, can we understand that? Can we identify those different clusters, those different groupings of how people are strategizing to do the task? That's part of the task. Um, there's a model that I, I still like to think about called the ease of language understanding model. This is not mine. Uh, this comes out of um, out of Europe, but it's it's been around for a while and it keeps getting kind of revised so that it becomes more and more complicated. But a simpli simplified version of this that I still think is useful just from a framework of thinking is um, that you have the speech input coming in, you have that in this little memory buffer that you're sitting with, and you're trying to match up that input that you just heard with your speech uh, long-term speech representations. So these phonological representations, how does the speech sound in your memory? And if they automatically match, so the, the quality of the signal is very good and it, it, it just connects very quickly with that representation in your long-term memory, you get this automatic process that leads to lexical access, which means you're able to retrieve that word re really efficiently from long-term memory. And then you recognize speech. You can, you can repeat back the word. It's obviously oversimplified, but in other cases, if the signal is bad, then you end up with this mismatch. So your long-term memory representations are not automatically triggered or um, activated by that speech input. In that case, then there's this more effortful, controlled, top-down processing that comes into play, which relies heavily on language knowledge and cognitive resources. So um, this is sort of, again, that general idea that this so my point in, in presenting this here is I think it's an interesting framework to think about as the signal gets worse, the more you start relying on top-down functions. But the problem with this is that's to a limit. And this model doesn't account very well for looking at variability in that speech input across uh, different listeners. And so that's, it's clearly more complicated than just signal gets worse, brain comes into play more. Okay. Uh, so to conclude this section, so we know these top-down processes matter, these bottom-up processes matter, and there's likelihood that uh, different patients have different profiles of how these functions work together. And that's something we're really interested in understanding better. So one of the ways we're trying to tackle this is um, the R01 that we're just now starting is called Predicting Speech Recognition in Adults Receiving Cochlear Implants. So this is, a lot of this work so far has been uh, very cross-sectional sort of looking at how these functions contribute at the same time as you're testing speech recognition. One of the big clinical questions I started with at the beginning was, well, can we predict outcomes better? Can we have a better idea? You see someone in clinic, can you predict how well they're going to do with a cochlear implant? So this is a longitudinal study over two years where we enroll patients preoperatively, do a large assessment battery using some of the, the same uh, measures and some additional measures to try to predict how well they're going to do over time with their cochlear implants. 
we're also interested in trajectory of improvement. If you can see, if you can identify um, predictors of someone who it's going to take two months to reach their plateau in performance versus someone who are really going to max out at three months, that could be useful from a counseling and rehab standpoint. The other thing that's uh, that'll be great about this study is we're going to incorporate more objective measures of bottom-up processing. So one of the problems with these tasks like the SMRT is it's very cognitive heavy or somewhat cognitive heavy, meaning when you hear those three tones and you have to say which one's different, you have to store that in memory and you have to make a response based on that. So there's, there's cognitive functioning that can contribute to that. Um, here, we're going to incorporate uh, ECOG and ECAP testing. So we'll do ECOG in the operating room, uh, which is something we pretty routinely do already. Um, and then post-operatively ECAP at a couple of measures, uh, a couple of time points. ECAPs are basically essentially electrically evoked compound action potentials. So you're stimulating electrodes and you're seeing how the nerve responds. So these should give us more objective assessments of how the cochlear implant is sending signals to the brain. Um, okay, so let me just check. So the last little bit here, I wanna talk about this other topic related, but somewhat different about does cochlear implantation improve cognition? Um, so we know that, you know, a big thing I've kind of glossed over here is that we have a big range of age included in these studies. And we also know this increasing work from Frank Lynn and a lot of other groups that as, um, as people get older, they, they have increasing incidence of dementia and cognitive decline. And now we know that there's this increasing connection between hearing loss and cognitive decline. Um, so we need to understand that better. We need to understand the impacts of treating the hearing loss on cognitive functions. Um, a couple of things that are really important with this is that crystalline intelligence is basically your kind of long-term language knowledge or your long-term knowledge of things, including language. And that seems to remain stable or even improve over your lifetime. So the older you get, your vocabulary knowledge, your language knowledge tends to stay pretty stable or even um, increase to some degree. Whereas these more fluid intelligence things like working memory, processing speed, inhibition, so these are more information processing, the types of tasks that I've been talking about previously, um, that declines with age. We know that. And that's part of the issue with aging and with, with cognitive decline and dementia is these factors seem to decrease and diminish over time. Um, so the, the question is, how is hearing loss impacting these different types of functions? And how does remediation of hearing loss actually lead to improvements? And we're a long way from really understanding that. Um, but we do know that the degree of hearing loss relates to the degree of cognitive impairment. So that's important because that suggests that there's, there's some real connection between those two. Um, and we also know from uh, the Lancet study that hearing loss is considered the largest modifiable risk factor in midlife for development of dementia. We don't know for sure that that means if you treat hearing loss, you're gonna improve dementia, but it's a suggestion at least. We still don't really understand these mechanisms. So really briefly, there's, there are a few different hypotheses about um, how is hearing loss connected to cognitive declines. I just want to run through these really quickly. So one is called the, the signal de uh, degradation or information degradation. This is the idea that um, as the sensory input is foggier, so through hearing loss, let's say, you have to tap into a lot more cognitive resources to figure out what you're looking at. So that's here's an example of here's a clear window, nice signal coming in. It's very easy to tell what you're looking at versus this foggy window. Similar idea with hearing loss. You have to really, and you know this, your patients show fatigue and, and effort through this process because they're trying to figure out what they're looking at or hearing in the case of our patients. So this idea is over time, there's wear and tear on the system, on the cognitive systems as a result of this chronic degradation of the signal. That's the idea there. Uh, a second one is the sensory deprivation. This is more of a direct thing where because you have hearing loss, cortical functioning is, is less, there's less stimulation, you get brain atrophy. Um, there seems to be some direct connection there. Or other people talk about it as through decreased social, socialization. So you have less auditory input, you're interacting less with people, you're then again getting uh, less um, auditory input and it's sort of this spiral towards um, co um, cortical degradation, I suppose. Common cause is basically they're not related, that there's some underlying cause that leads to both hearing loss and cognitive decline. And there's some evidence that there's, there's something to that. All of these have some evidence for them. Um, a little bit less on this cognitive load on perception. This one is that um, as 
as you get older or as you have cognitive decline, your performance on, on hearing tests actually declines. That suggests that these hearing tests have some cognitive component to them. And if you know, you know, you've all done or seen hearing tests, you know, doing a, a pure tone audiogram, not highly cognitively challenging, but there's some evidence that some of the speech and, and uh, testing that we do in the clinic may be impacted by hearing loss itself, uh, by cognitive decline itself. Um, okay. This, I don't expect you to see a lot on this, but there are a number of studies that go back quite a ways to look at the impact of um, hearing aids on cognitive functioning. One of the things I wanna point out with these little circles, squares, is that the mode of administration of these cognitive tasks really matters. Um, and we know this also in our cochlear implant patients. If you give a task verbally or even audiovisually, so say the, the clinician is sitting there in front of their patient and they're, they're administering this task, the performance of that patient is going to suffer um, on a cognitive task as a result of their hearing loss. And so we have to take this stuff with a grain of salt because let's say you test someone with, without a hearing aid on a cognitive test, and then you put a hearing aid on them and you test them again six months later, if they show improvements on that test, is it because their underlying cognition has actually improved or is it just because the sensory input is better because you're delivering it through a hearing aid? So I think we have to be really careful about interpreting these studies. And I think the same thing goes for our cochlear implant studies. And so there's a number of these, there's fewer in this patient population, but several kind of longitudinal studies that are looking at the impact of getting a cochlear implant on cognitive assessment batteries. And all of these show some positive benefits. Um, there's a newer one by Rich Gergel at Utah, who's doing really nice work, who um, has shown that um, they found no significant improvements at six months, but 12 months after implantation, there were some improvements on some of their battery of cognitive measures. We've done this also. This is at six months. Uh, this is 19 people using this similar task battery that I've already shown you, these visual measures. And we've seen some impact of cochlear implantation from pre-implant to six months post-implantation on performance on these visual cognitive measures. They're not dramatic, but there's something there and there's more to explore. And it also depends very much on the task that you're asking the patients to do. Um, let me skip that. Okay, so last little bit here. So um, Jim Naples is an otologist in Boston that um, we've been collaborating with. And he was really interested in sort of looking at the bigger picture of what's in the literature on these topics, these two topics of does cochlear implantation lead to improvements in specific areas of cognition? So the idea here is, can we break down, well, where is that impact of treating the hearing loss with a cochlear implant? Under what domains of cognitive function um, is there an impact? Um, and the issue here is that sometimes we use cognition as sort of this catch-all term, but cognition is a broad range of functions. And so we want to know more about well, where are these act where are the improvements actually occurring as a result of cochlear implantation, and the other one back to the earlier parts of my talk where these specific cognitive cons constructs seem to really impact speech recognition outcomes. Um, the challenge here is when you look across the literature, there's all these assessment batteries, there are all these different outcome measures that are used from speech recognition. There's no real way to um, that's, that's accepted sort of in cognitive psychology to define where these different tests go. So that makes it very challenging. So we've kind of started at a very high level of just looking, trying to categorize these different tests and categorize these different cognitive functions and identify, can we see across the literature trends in, in this, the answers to these questions? Um, so we found 42 studies that address these. And these are basically showing if you, if you have assessments of Global cognition does impact, does cochlear implantation improve that? And that's the C, you know, we're doing that for each of these. So what we see is some of these domains seem to have a greater impact um, of cochlear implant, implantation on cognitive functioning than other domains. That's sort of what we're wanting to start getting at, but it's very hard to do any sort of quantifiable analyses with these. Same thing goes for testing, cognitive testing and speech recognition. And I'm gonna go back to the, the summary here is that, um, the bottom line appears to be yes for each of these. Uh, cochlear implantation appears to impact cognition and cognition appears to impact speech recognition outcomes. But the domains of functioning that contribute to each of these, to, um, these effects may differ. And that makes sense. It's, 
there's no reason to necessarily assume that uh, that these are going to be the same cognitive constructs that are the answer for each of these questions. So that's something that really needs to be teased apart. But this this general review is sort of um, enlightening in the fact that it seems like these different categories of functioning um, differ based on the question being asked. Okay, so last little bit here. So future direction for this, there's a lot of wide open um, room for study on this. Again, we don't really know which cognitive constructs matter for either of these questions. We don't know which measures are the best to use, um, in particular outcome measures um, of speech recognition. You know, we sort of, in the clinic, you guys see CNC scores in AZ Bio, in Quiet, and in, in Babel, but that's a really limited way of, of assessing speech recognition performance. It's what we use, but it's, it's not the whole picture. Um, so what measures are most related to cognitive functioning? Timeline of improvements, just like what I was talking with this R01 study is how do we characterize and understand that trajectory of improvements after cochlear implantation, both for speech perception and potentially for cognition? Which patients show benefits? Um, again, back to this individual differences thing and clustering analyses, where are we seeing impacts of cochlear implants and where are we not? One of the things that's cool uh, about uh, Rich Gergel's new study is they found that those patients who had baseline the worst cognition showed the greatest improvements. So that's encouraging, the fact that they got an implant and they actually showed the biggest improvements versus people with relatively more normal cognition um, is, is nice to see because it is suggestive that, you know, if we treat these people with hearing loss, that cognition may improve. And again, most of this stuff is not really getting mechanistically at what is the relationship and what is the impact um, on those cognitive functions. We just need to know a whole lot more about that. All right, that is all I have. So thank you so much for listening. I do wanna end up again, acknowledging all the, the team and mentors and collaborators that have worked with me over the last few years and happy to take some questions if you guys have some. Any questions for me or comments or critiques? Okay. Oh, here's the so critiques. Okay. That. No, not a critique. Um, yeah, so I think this is really fascinating. And um, I don't want to even add your plate, but um, here at Vanderbilt, they're doing some multi sensory mm -hmm. um, ideas. And the basic premise, and maybe this is going to stuff for you, but that there's actually a synergistic benefit of combining auditory and visual. And, um, you know, Actually, Renee can speak more of this. She's, I, I tend to work with the pediatric population, but um, you know, the idea would be this um, combination of auditory and visual to bootstrap. And um, I think you saw a little of that with your, uh, you're using a visual auditory working memory or visual working memory task and auditory may be different. And I don't know if you're checking out, I know it's the tablet, but anyway, uh, one more thing to put on this massive uh, model that you have might be this multi-sensory processing. And here at Vanderbilt, we have a really uh, strong multi-sensory processing group. We're doing some work already. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, I met with Mark Wallace yesterday. Yeah, we had so a Mark, really yeah, good talk. Mark is kind of here. Mark and I have done some work with multi-sensory and autism. And, but I know he's also working with this particular question. Yeah, no, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, we ran out of time yesterday. But we're... So one of the things we have... Um, we've looked at that a little bit to kind of see also if if people who integrate that information better before implantation show better outcomes. Yeah, and it's, kind of where I was going with it. yeah. it's what we have so far is messy because your baseline audit auditory performance is way too messy. So we don't have a we don't have the right tasks to really try to get at that. But I think that's a really interesting question. The other thing is from a rehab standpoint, does training through combined modalities lead to greater improvements in one, you know, one modality? And it seems like there's some evidence that that may be the case. So I think that's a huge area yeah, of interest. The market developed some computer games that narrow the auditory binding window for the visual signal. And you know, again, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't, I only know to be dangerous, but it's really an intriguing. Is he using them for training purposes? Yeah, so they, they have a computer game where they train okay. uh, binding the auditory and visual signal more precisely. Mm -hmm. And they've shown some really positive impact in the pediatric population. Okay. But again, I, I don't really know as much about you know, the adult. I know the cognitive areas you're talking about. Yeah, no, it's a really exciting area. Thanks. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, so, uh, for example, one of the most rewarding is 
That is a terrible question. <laughs> I don't think you want to hear that. No, um, thank you, first of all. Well, actually, I was just talking with Nate about this. Um, I don't know. I, one of the things that I think I tried to do when I was starting through fellowship working on this topic was really focus. And I think that's, it's plus and minus. I think fellowship is a hard time. I mean, if, if you're going through, like, fellowship is a great time to sort of develop, start developing a research niche. Um, and I think if I hadn't started doing it then, it'd be very hard once you get into attending Hood to start developing a niche. Uh, you can, uh, I, but I would say two things on that. One is that is a good time to develop some skills and some collaborations and some mentors and some networking that you can really leverage as you go forward. Um, so I think fellowship's a key time to do that. But it's also hard because you don't necessarily know what you, you want to do. Um, I mean, maybe you do, maybe you come in and you've been working in basic science since you were an undergrad, and you know, that's exactly what you want to do. But I think it's tough. I remember struggling a lot to say, to figure out at the end of fellowship, is this the right direction? And um, for me, it was sort of like, let's give it a shot, you know? And I, I, I continue to find it really fascinating. And I think it was something that I remember working on this stuff and it was the first stuff that I worked on in research where it felt like a different activation of a different part of my brain it was really fun for me because it was just, it was different. Um, and it opened these collaborative opportunities. And I got to learn from all these people that are much smarter than me and have very different expertise. I'm getting off on a tangent, but that, that was really fun. So I think identifying something you get really excited about and trying to develop somewhat of a focus on that um, is really important. And it's hard to say no to other things, but at some point you have to start to focus. Um, the other thing I was going to say about that, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, the other thing is just persistence and apply for lots of grants. I mean, start with foundation grants and just start applying and take proposals and recycle them and get it and get feedback and make it better and make it better and just keep working at it. It's there's lots of lots of denials of grants um, and they, they continue to be. But um, you just got to that's part of the process. And if you hate, if you absolutely hate grant writing, it's probably not going to be something you can stick with. Well, no, he's like, no. I mean, you have to do it, right? Everyone hates grant writing. The curiosity you have is awesome. And I love it. And I have to, and researchers do, but it's not common necessarily. And so what I, what I tell my mentees is that, you know, you're going to get three out of four rejected. So if you were a rat or a monkey, you quit lever pressing for food. There's something a little different about us that are in the discovery enterprise. And, and so you want to nurture that in the residents and fellows early on and kindle that flame. Like you said, there's trade offs. Yes. I think what I would say to that, though, is if, if you start doing it, you're like, this is not for me, right. and it, then it's never going to be for you. Right. Um, and I've seen that. I've seen people, you know, they love the process, but then the grants kill them. Um, and no, you get rejected a lot. You just have to have the attitude that you just couldn't really communicate how awesome your idea was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a good way of looking at it. You gotta have that. Would you have it? Just like that. I'm trying. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.